Welcome to the keynote panel. Allow me to introduce you to Mr. David Axelrod, Director of the po Institute of Politics. A University of Chicago alumnus, David Axelrod is a 35-year veteran of American politics and journalism. Prior to becoming a political consultant, Mr. Axelrod spent eight years as a reporter and columnist for the Chicago Tribune, including a stint as the City Half Bureau Chief. As a political consultant, Mr. Axel has managed media and communication strategies for more than 150 local, state, and national campaigns. He most recently served as senior strategist to President Obama's successful re-election campaign. He served in that same role in then-Senator Obama's 2008 presidential campaign, before going on to serve in the White House as senior advisor to the president. After the 2012 campaign, Mr. Axel turned his focus to the Institute of Politics, to help inspire and train the next generation of leaders. I will now pass the microphone to Mr. Axelrod. She said such nice things about me, I can't believe I was going to preempt her. So, I want to welcome you all on behalf of Latin America Matters and the Harris School and uh, other campus uh, partners. This, these are the kinds of events that we want to see frequently uh, at the University of Chicago, bringing practitioners from across the globe uh, to our campus. Now for our speaker, Alvaro uh, uh, Uribe, served as the 58th president of Columbia. His election in 2002 came after a long public career uh, as a local official, uh, mayor, senator, and governor. And it came at a critical juncture uh, for his nation, Columbia, was gripped by violence, fueled by the FARC guerrillas, various paramilitary forces, and narcotics trafficking. Uh, Colombia was reeling under the highest murder rate in the world. Kidnappings were rampant. Adding to this burden, and in part uh, because of it, Colombia's economy was faltering. Its government was flirting with insolvency, and faith in Colombia's democratic institutions had been shaken. Mr. Uribe began his independent campaign for the presidency at 2% uh, in the polls, written off by the political class. And as I said to you uh, before, Mr. President, I have some knowledge about what that's like uh, from my own experiences. Uh, but his single-minded determination to break the cycle of violence ultimately propelled him from Altaran to the presidency. Uh, the day Mr. Uribe took office, the FARC brazenly shelled the presidential headquarters, but President Uribe took the fight to the FARC with new resources and resolve. He negotiated with some of the paramilitary forces who stood down, and he targeted the burgeoning narcotics trade. And under his leadership, the murder rate dropped to a 20-year low. Kidnappings also fell uh, dramatically. By reducing the violence that discouraged foreign investment, and by promoting economic and social reforms, and pursuing aggressive management of government, President Uribe helped restore the Colombian economy. Under his leadership, the GDP grew at a rate of 4.3% annually. Uh, last year, <clears throat> just a decade after the nation teetered on the brink of default, President Obama endorsed Colombia's bid for inclusion with other elite economies in the OECD. Um, it was a recognition of the progress that Colombia uh, had made under President Uribe's leadership. And of course, President Obama also signed in 2011 a long sought free trade agreement uh, with Colombia. Uh, President Uribe was a staunch ally of the United States in the war in Iraq uh, and battle with terrorism and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President George W. Bush. Uh, he's been an outspoken voice for representative democracies in Latin America, uh, often squaring off uh, with the late uh, Hugo Chavez of Venezuela. President Uribe won constitutional changes that permitted him to run uh, f and, uh, for and win a second term as president. But when the courts ruled against further constitutional changes, uh, he accepted their verdict, an important statement about the primacy of democratic institutions uh, in Colombia. And as the handful of protesters uh, we saw outside reflect President Uribe's presidency and post-presidency have uh, uh, not been without controversy uh, over issues such as human rights and civil liberties. But few would contest the statement that President Uribe provided strong, uh, determined leadership that was absolutely crucial 
uh, in Colombia's hour, uh, hour of need, which is why he remains an enormously popular figure uh, in his country today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in uh, welcoming President Uribe. Twelve and twenty-seven. I will try to do my, my best with the shortest possible introduction to leave all the room for your questions and comments. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Rosa. It is a great honor for me to chair this forum. This morning, I learned a lot listening to the mayors of Curitiba and Chicago and to the Mexican professor on social security. Let me share with you some ideas I have, some information on Latin America and the Caribbean. The region as a whole has almost 600 million people, very young people. The average age is 27, but the youth unemployment is very high. Therefore, at this moment, we see that this is very advantageous to have this young population, but at the, at the same time, it is a, a, a great challenge. Uh, at the same time, the region uh, has performed much better in the economies, in the economy. The problems of default, and the problems of hyperinflation are problems of the past. However, we see some signs of danger in the case of uh, Argentina and in the case of Venezuela. Colombia never defaulted, and Colombia never uh, suffered hyperinflation. The vast majority of the countries are guided by um, democratic principles. However, it is important to consider which of these countries are progressive and which are regressive democracies. The region is very well endowed with natural resources. The world will need for the year 2030 to increase by 50% the production of food. Many countries in the world can not comply with their share, with their portion. Therefore, in the region, we have countries that can do it. For instance, when we study the case of Brazil, Brazil could pass from the production of 170 million of tons of food to almost uh, uh, 400 million. Argentina can pass from producing 100 million to producing more than 200. My country, Colombia, can pass from producing uh, 30 million tons to producing more than 60 million tons. The region has 26% uh, of the worldwide arable land. In some cases, Brazil is the largest exporter of uh, maize of soybeans, of beef, of orange juice, not to speak of minerals. The region has all the possibilities in this regard. One second challenge for the world is how to increase the supply of energy by 40% by the year 2030. The region has 10% of the world oil reserves. 6% of the natural gas reserves. And we have all the possibilities for a hydropower, all the possibilities for eolic and windy en energy, and all the possibilities for other thermal sources and for biofuels. Brazil is the largest in the production of ethanol from sugarcane. Colombia 
did not produce one single gallon 10 years ago. And now, because of our policies, Colombia is the second largest in the region and the first one in the production of biodiesel from oil palm. In the region, we have two possibilities to advance in the generation of, in the production of biofuels. First, we have enough land, and we do not need to cut the jungle down. It is very important, because my country has 53% of the territory still in jungle. Brazil has a very big proportion. Peru, almost around, around 60%. Therefore, our main contribution to the policies against the climate change is to preserve our rainforest. And the second possibility we have to produce biocombustibles is that we have enough land to expand simultaneously the production, the guarantee of food security and the inputs for biocombustibles. One third challenge I want to refer is that the world will need to increase soft water supply by 50%. Some years ago, we thought that soft water will never be tradable. But today, it, uh, the, that idea is becoming a real fact. Some weeks ago, I visited Trinidad and Tobago. And for my surprise, I found that this country exports small cans of soft water to my country. Therefore, we need to be prepared to see the containers on the sea, on the very big post Panama chips with soft water. In the region, we have two very important elements. We have 50% of all the creeks and rivers of soft water all over the world, but at the same time, 57% of the virgin jungle, of the virgin, virgin rainforest. One idea I want to share with you is that we need to meet these two elements. How we are going to help the world to meet the new necessity of making soft water tradable and how we are going to keep our rainforest. For instance, the Amazon Basin. One of the main projects in my administration was to come to terms with rural families for them to abandon the production of coca leaves to protect collectively some big areas, to maintain these areas free from illicit drugs, and under the supervision of the United Nations, when the United Nations decertified, my government did pay some fees to these families. In Latin America, the world will need to think how we are going to offset the rural communities for them to keep the jungle without destruction. We reached this kind of agreements with 90,000 rural families in my country. But we need many, many more. What my administration did in Colombia, in my opinion, was to plant good seeds. We did not leave the country convert into a paradise. But uh, we made significant progress in the nation. Leaving aside these traits of the region, let me refer briefly to five elements. I consider the five democratic standards for the region. Security, the freedom of investment, but with one particular orientation, inclusive freedom of investment. 
third social cohesion, fourth independent institutions, and fifth pluralistic people participation. On the side of security, we could see some countries like Colombia and Mexico that have recognized problems regarding security, have made them implicit, and have made the decision to fight these problems. On the other side, we see Venezuela. Venezuela was a peaceful country. By the times Colombia suffered 68 cases of killing per every 100,000 inhabitants. Venezuela had 22. Today, Colombia has less than 30, and Venezuela 50. And Caracas is becoming one of the most violent cities in the world, with 100 killings per every 100,000 inhabitants. At that time, Colombia had 3,000 cases of kidnapping per year. Venezuela had 62. Last year, Colombia had less than 200. And Venezuela, more than 1,200. And the main problem, in my opinion, is the attitude of the government. The governor of Venezuela has stated that the problem of violence will be solved once socialism wins. This is what I heard 45 years ago from the Colombian Marxist-oriented guerrillas. And what I did was to increase violence, to create the paramilitary reaction with the same violent methods. We defeated paramilitaries. We extradited the kingpins to the United States. They are in jail in this country. At the beginning, Colombian left guerrillas and paramilitaries were uh, far away from illicit drugs. At the end, they had been co-opted by illicit drugs. And, and violence created in Colombia what I call a vicious circle. More violence, less investment. Unemployment in the year 2002 was in between 16 and 20. At the same time, poverty reached over 53. And of course, bad economics and the uh, impaired social fabric created much more violence. Our effort was to replace this vicious circle for what I call the virtue circle. More security, more investment, more social cohesion, more security. In the region we see countries such as Brazil. It was a peaceful country. Brazil eh, never fired one single shot for its independence. However, today, with, because of narco-trafficking, Brazil has some cities with increasing violence. And we should con be concerned because of the high level of violence in some countries in Central America, such as Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. The second and the third element, the freedom of investment and social cohesion, in my opinion, they should move forward in balance. In Venezuela, if we accept that the social policies implemented 10, 12 years ago are right policies, I cannot discuss if they are right or wrong. What I want to say is that social policies are not sustainable without private investment, even with OIA. The current economic situation in Venezuela is a clear indicator that Misiones, the name the government of Venezuela gave to its social, its, uh, social uh, activity, 
Misiones are not sustainable because the country is going to bankruptcy. Fidel Castro used to say in the middle of the 80s that Latin America was in need of having a socialist country with oil, but the lack of private investment has indicated to us that even with oil, social policies are not sustainable. On the other side, I see Peru. In my opinion, President Humala is a great example because he has increased taxes a little bit to expand tax collection and social policies without discouraging investors. He is on the way of creating a great equilibrium between investment and social cohesion. But one main challenge we have in the region is the high level of youth unemployment. In my opinion, youngsters won't have new possibilities by the traditional ways of seeking jobs. In my opinion, we need to make investment in the region inclusive, to put it affordable for everyone, for youngsters, for our middle classes, for the poorest people. For we need a combination of education, high rate of long-term investment, and at the same time, how to provide resources to starting innovative enterprises set by youngsters. We need a combination of vocational training, high school, technological teaching, university, R&D. And if someone of you is a member of an investment bank and the president of my country calls you I need you to put money in these starting corporations by Johnster in my country. Maybe you will answer, no, we cannot, because it is a, a risky business. But if the president of my country calls you and say to you, the government is going to put money, invent your capital funds for the new enterprises. You are going to put money, and you are going to manage it without political interference maybe you will accept. We need to create a mentality in the region of innovation. We need to inculcate the spirit of entrepreneurship. In my opinion, it is very important. Look at this, Spain. That week we saw a pre-release telling us that Spain is having youth unemployment at the level of 57. In the year 2007, the, we knew that Spain had in between 18 and 23. Nobody by those times thought that Spain could, have, could reach 57. In Latin America, this morning I read that the average of youth unemployment is 13. However, there are countries with youth unemployment at the level of 53. Therefore, we need to work the hardest we can to face, to deal with this problem. And the fourth and the fifth element are independent institutions and pluralistic people participation. Dictatorships blatantly disrupted the independence of institutions. Now, I go there are governments with the disguise of elections, for them to show up as Democrats that are eliminating the independence of institutions without the same way the dictators did, with the same outcome, with a very subtle behavior. Therefore, we see problems of the lack of independence of institutions in many countries, beginning with Venezuela. And in the relationship between the citizens and the state, it is very important to have institutional relationships that 
people depend on institutions, not on the wings of the current leader. And I see that today we notice new ways to eliminate, to reduce, to limit pluralistic people participation. The government in Venezuela owns more than 57 media. It is having the mono monopoly of the media. The president, during his campaign for the election, had more than used more than, a, than a one hour per day in the media. The candidate of the opposition had only four minutes per day. Therefore, pluralistic people participation is quite difficult. I invite you to see what is happening in Bolivia. The government uh, has bought the main TV channel and many governments in the region are imposing limitations to the independent media, expropriating the independent media, or using their funds to buy the media and to expand the state-controlled media. I want to stop here to give you all the time for your questions and comments. I suppose that the noises I can listen from here at the outside. It could be from protesters. I would like to invite them to send some of their emissaries to here to discuss with them. Professor, I am, thank you very much again. And it is 12.49. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I'm given to believe that you guys have been writing questions down. Is that, is that the case? So we're going to collect those, and I will be the genial middleman here and, uh, and ask these questions. Um, while, uh, while they're being collected, let me, let me ask a few uh, of my own. Um, there is you know, one way in which our country interacts with the region that's um, of a, a pressing policy question is, is something you touched on, which is uh, the, the drug trade and the impact uh, on, on uh, your countries, on the U.S. Um, there is, there's been a debate um, in this country as to how effective the drug laws here have been and what the impact has been uh, there, some have argued that um, uh, harsh penalties have been counter uh, to our public policy goals, have, have increased violence here and so on. Um, talk to me about your attitude on, I know you have very strong attitudes on this, about what an appropriate policy is to diminish um, the uh, impact of, uh, of violence on both sides of uh, in Latin America and in the U.S.? It is only one point of the many points we should consider regarding the relationship between the United States and Latin America. On this single point, the United States implemented with my predecessor, President Pastrana, a very good policy. Its name is Plan Colombia. This policy has given continuity by President Bush and by President Obama. This policy has succeeded in Colombia. Colombia was a country that produced 1,000 tons of cocaine. At the end of our administration, the production had come down to below 200 tons. If Official statistics say that by the year 2000, Colombia had 180,000 hectares of illicit crops. The Colombian police says that if by the year 2000, Colombia 
would have had the same methodology than today, the outcome would have been more than 400,000. At the end of our administration, we had 67. Problems, consumption, and guns. In my opinion, we can no longer say that consumption is in the north and production in the south. We are having increasing problems of consumption in many countries of the, of the region. In Colombia, consumption has grown a lot. I have friends in Brazil who say that the vast majority of the cocaine exported by Bolivia is consumed in Brazil. As, and as we are having problems with consumption, in the industrialized countries, there is production of illicit drugs. We cannot speak only about cocaine and marijuana. We need to speak about uh, the, the other the synthetic drugs. And there are more than 1,800 1, illegal synthetic drugs. Guns. In my opinion, the United States must answer positively to the claims of Mexico. I have heard from the government of Mexico that in the last 28 months, the Mexican police has seized more than 100,000 assault weapons sold legally in the United States cities to civilians. Weapons that have passed to the hands of medic me Mexican criminals. We need the United, uh, the United States make decisions on this regard. How to confront the problem. In my country, we introduced a constitutional amendment during our administration with two main points. Addicts should not be taken to jail. They need hospitals, medical doctors, but distributors, they need be taken to jail. The policy in the United States recently announced by President Obama, in my opinion, is good, but it, it, it needs clarity to the ears of the Latin American people. Because the government of the United States, in accordance with the media, has stated, we are going to expand to increase the budgetary appropriations to pay for that it's to be taken to hospitals. But in my opinion, it is not legalization because uh, you keep in place the laws to take uh, traffickers to jail. In my opinion, the combination of hospitals for consumers and uh, jail for traffickers is a good combination. Marijuana as an expression of soft drugs. There is also evidence that soft drugs are in many times channels for people to get engaged in hard drugs. And one final point, explaining my bias. When I ask the Colombian police in a country with that had uh, 30,000 killings close to it in the year 2002, and last year a little bit over 14, it is still very high. When I have asked to the Colombian police, let me know 
<coughs> what percentage of the murderers arrested after they have committed a crime have proceeded under the effects of illegal drugs, the Colombian police has said to me 100%. The Mexican authorities state that in Mexico, 70%. And during the Bush and the Obama administration, I asked to, the, to several secretaries of the cabinet in the United States, and their answer was over 50. And I have not found this argument. Many people say that the right to consume drugs is an, is an essential freedom. But we need to consider individual freedoms never to prevail over collective duties. And consumption of illicit drugs alienate the individual. And alienation is the same than slavery. And when the individual loses his freedoms, his possibility to conduct freely himself and becomes alienated, therefore the individual begins to be a danger for the society as a whole. But there are many different issues to consider in a more broader spectrum the relationship between the United States and the region. Uh, just to follow up on this, and this is off of one of the questions that was, uh, that was sent up here, uh, and obviously you disagree with the premise of this, but keep, in keeping drugs illegal is hurt many Latin American countries, particularly Colombia and Mexico, by giving money and power to cartels since the war on drugs has proven mostly ineffective. Isn't it time to talk about legalizing? You, you, you obviously strongly disagree with that. But, uh, you know, here in the city of Chicago, we have, for example, enormous amount of crime associated with street gangs who traffic in narcotics. And um, there is the argument that, the argument has been made that if you took the profit incentive away that you would deflate that threat and you know you can talk about this on a larger scale is that a, a legitimate argument on your point on your in your view I respect all the arguments but I disagree because in the world there are no less than 1,800 illegal drugs therefore you legalize one and what you are doing with with others and one problem we see in the industrialized countries is that they do not assume responsibilities. They are, uh, they are not accountable, for instance, for uh, their fight against money laundering, against uh, illegal wealth. In Colombia, we have worked a lot against money laundering and against, uh, against uh, illicit wealth. I remember in Mexico, I was invited to speak before a meeting of 8,000 teachers. And at any moment, they shouted against me. And they told me, we do not want war. And my answer was, security is not war. And I said to them, the idea of isolating narco traffickers is idea proving ineffectual because uh, they have no limits. One day they will go to the legislators and say to the legislators, you should enact this law or buy your funeral. One day they can go, they can go to, the, to your schools and to say to you, teachers, you should grade my son with A plus or, or pay for your funeral. Therefore, this is uh, an invasive criminal activity. I have said Mexico has to think how Mexico was six years ago and how it is now. Now Mexico is optimistic, thinking in structural reforms. Six years ago, 
in Mexico, it seemed that the institutions were being disrupted by criminality. In my opinion, the courageous fight of President Calderon has turned around the equation because even although Mexico has still problems of the regard, now the institutions prevail again over criminality. And uh, last question on this, and it, it came up a couple of times. Uh, can you extrapolate, can you, from your experience in Colombia, what, what are the two or three things that you would advise the government of Mexico in dealing with this problem? No advice to the government of Mexico. <laughs> Because from Latin America, we have uh, that the uh, people of Mexico are, uh, have a great leadership. Uh, they have led their own policies with uh, all the pride in, in private. I, I talk a lot with President Calderon and with President uh, Fox and with uh, the new president, Peña Nieto. And in Colombia, we had the opportunity to train 11,000 policemen of the Mexican police. And I handed out to President Calderon uh, a, a piece of legislation, a piece of, pieces of legislation we enacted in Colombia. The legislation to fight money laundering and the legislation to uh, confiscate illicit wealth. You, uh, in fact, you, you, one of your... Uh, and we extradited during my administration 1,200 narco-traffickers. When you said, Professor, in your generous introduction that I negotiated with paramilitaries, no. We enacted a law, the law of justice, peace of reparation, with benefits for guerrillas and paramilitaries without impunity and without political eligibility. These are the main disagreements with the new legislation in Colombia. And under, because of our policy on democratic security, this policy was a policy on, democratic, on security, but with democratic values. We saw the demobilization of 35,000 members of the paramilitary guns and the demobilization of 18,000 18, members of the guerrilla groups. Therefore, when they did not comply with the law, we never hesitated to extradite them. And we extradited the 14 main real leaders of the paramilitary organization. And they are here in jails in the United States. Um, let's turn to economic issues uh, uh, of which you spoke. Uh, a questioner asked, why hasn't productivity increased as much in Latin America? Why hasn't there been greater leaps in productivity? Thirty years ago, economists recommended that Latin America should pass from the commodities-based economy to the knowledge-based economy. With the boom in the Chinese, in the Indian economy, things have ha changed. Even with this decrease in the annual economic growth in China that has come down from 10 to 7. China will take rural communities to new cities in the, in the coming years. The new president in China, Xi Jinping, has said that they will continue and they will speed up this project. For the year 2025, one billion people in the planet will be taken to cities. Therefore, for Latin American commodities, it is very important. But we need to add knowledge, to add value. 
In this regard, Mexico is a great example. Because 60% of the totals of the total export of Mexico have added value. And Mexico is becoming the largest provider of manufactured goods to the United States. Even Mexico will be larger than China. In uh, other countries, they are making efforts. In Chile, in my country. Just to speak uh, only on my country, we have, uh, we advance a lot in the, we, during our administration, we, we have three policies. At the same time, security, investment promotion, and social cohesion. Uh, and we have short victories in, in, the, in the three pillars. And we, we measure how the country was going on in every policy. For, is, for instance, in the index released by the World Bank of doing business, we passed from being at the 78th position, and, and in the large year of our administration, Colombia was uh, 38. But we need to advance, for instance, to have a, a much more expedite justice administration. And Colombia uh, lacks in infrastructure. And all, all the countries in the region, they need how to speed up the idea of entrepreneurship. The, the main problem in my country to explaining this lack of higher productivity is uh, that we still lack in infrastructure. It's a great opportunity for investors, for domestic and international investors. And Even Brazil, I cannot understand because in Brazil, differently than Colombia, the main industrial cities in Brazil are very close to the ocean. Our capital city, the great city of Bogota, it has uh, 1,100 kilometers in distance to the Caribbean. Therefore, in my country, it's much more difficult to catch up with infrastructure. But we have excellent, excellent uh, legal frameworks to combine uh, public works, public budgets with uh, private concessions. Um, this is a, uh, a real, uh, this is sort of the flip side of the question um, about higher productivity. How do we create policies to protect against job losses to cheaper markets as development uh, uh, and increases in standards of living raise prevailing wages? We have suffered the problem of currency, currency appreciation. During my administration, we said this. We need long-term investors, not a speculation for short-term profits. With all the respect to the independence of the central bank, we coordinated decisions, for instance, to impose taxes to short-term investments on portfolio. At the same time, we created incentives for domestic and foreign investment, this kind of investment professor. We didn't lower taxes with the idea that the amount of money saved by people because of lower taxes necessarily goes to new investment. This is a chance. What we did was this. If you invest $100 in Colombia, you have the right to deduct $30. We create in, in incentives under the conditions that people make the, the, made the, the investments. And it was good for us to, to be competitive to improve productivity and competitiveness, and at the same time, to offset the problem of appreciation. We supported some sectors under two conditions, that they do not harm the workers, and at the same time, 
that they introduce better practices for becoming much more competitive. But the problem of our currencies continues being a, a difficult problem for the economy of the region as a whole. You, um, you're obviously, you, you have a deep belief in um, these policies to encourage investment, encourage entrepreneurship. A questioner asks, why do you think center-right policies, such as investment and entrepreneurship, have not been adopted by all nations in the region? Um, and uh, is there a, a, a clear, I think it's, I can't read what this word is, by some towards, uh, uh, towards socialism. Is there a clear inclination toward uh, socialism in the region? Among, among some. Every socialism in the past and now has failed because of the lack of a standard of living. In my opinion, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the transition from the Mao Zedong China to the then Xiaoping China, were because people lack the possibilities of better standards of living. The explanation, the lack of creativity. And creativity is definitely pegged to private investors. Therefore, we believe in Cuba. Cuba has been a failure. Cuba has, has survived for two subsidies. First, the Soviet subsidy. I want to remember to you, dear students, that once Soviet Union collapsed, the Cuban economy came down by 40%. But it found a new savior, the government of Venezuela. And now we have another point to be checked, to do follow up. The transfers from the United States to the Cuban people. Cuba, the only success they can claim is that they have eliminated extreme poverty, but all people in Cuba are poor. Uh, and there is no creativity. At the beginning, they thought that education and health were going to succeed. And now, even in education and health, they are failing. Therefore, I believe in the idea that our country needs a long-term high rate of savings and investments, no below 30%. And for the private sector, no below 22 as percentage to the GDP. But at the same time, the main objection is, but this is exclusive. This is reachable only by the wealthiest people. Therefore, we need to it to make it inclusive. For we need this combination of uh, job-relevant education with, with uh, venture capital funds, with funds of guarantees to promote, to support the uh, entrepreneurial spirit, especially in the middle class, in the poor people, and in the youngsters. We planted seeds in Colombia, but we were short. We need much more. It's interesting to hear you talk about this because these are almost universal discussions. Now, we're having this same discussion in the United States uh, in terms of job opportunities for young people, in terms of st keeping standards of living high, the need for education and job-related training, and you hear these discussions, uh, you hear these discussions all over. Let me just ask one follow-up. Professor, on but in Colombia, more than the discussion, excuse me, I apologize for this for saying this, because I have to defend myself, because I have a lot of controversy all over the world. One of, main, of the main indicators of our social policy was our advance in the regard. Colombia has the leading institution all over the region in vocational training and in, in uh, technological teaching. At the beginning, we had, we trained one million 100,000 workers per year. At the end of our administration, over 8 million. We passed from having 
40,000 students affiliated to the three-year technological programs to having half a million. However, we need to uh, expand it by three times. Therefore, Colombia has advanced. But at the same time, I can explain the advances. I have to accept that for us to give all the high school graduates full opportunities, we need to, uh, to triple these efforts. I, I, I was curious about one thing that you said in a, in a previous answer. Uh, what, what is your analysis of U.S. policy toward Cuba and what it should, uh, what the policy should be? We, we, we have an ongoing debate in this country about that, about whether the policy we've adopted has been effective. Uh, we, there has been a change in the policy toward remittances. You, I think, referred to that from families to people back in Cuba. What, what should the U.S. policy toward Cuba be at this juncture? I have no clear ideas. Some that surprised me because you seem to have clear ideas on, it, on a lot of things. No, no. Some, <laughs> some, uh, some speculation. Last year in D.C., I asked why the United States is facilitating transfers to the Cuban people. And I received some answers because of humanitarian reasons. And someone told me uh, the amount won't increase. Maybe there will be the same amount. But before, this money was sent illegally. Now the same amount will be sent in accordance with the legislation. What could happen in Cuba? And it is very important for students. I recommend you to, to go deeper with this hypothesis. The United States is sending money. Uh, the United States sends money to El Salvador. In the last three years in El Salvador has not been an acceptable rate of investment. However, people have survived because of the transfers. It is a problem. And people do not realize that they need to promote investment and creativity because they are receiving transfers. Could it happen in Cuba? And in Cuba, there is a different aspect. The regime has open ways for bureaucrats to undertank small and humble businesses. And one Brazilian engineering corporation of the bridge is working and will operate a very big port in Cuba. My question is, with these small lights of freedom, will they be enough for Cuba to prosper? Will it be enough for Cubans to say that they are free? Or once they realize that they could improve a little bit because of these small freedoms, they will ask for more freedoms, for economic freedoms and for political freedoms? It is to be seen, and it is very important to observe. In a, for the universities, my main concern is that Castro is not portrayed as he is. It is necessary to look with hindsight and to study what they did, how many people they killed in El Paredón. Because in Latin America and in some sectors of the United States public opinion, I see differences. We do not refer, do not treat the dictators the same. In the case of Pinochet, all the, all the region rally against. In the case in, of Cuba, no. In my opinion, there is some 
permissiveness regarding the dictatorship in Cuba. And what makes me the most concerned is the permissiveness against the dictatorship of Venezuela. Professor, two weeks ago, I was said, it is better for the opposition of Venezuela not to win now. Because if they win now, they will win by a very narrow margin. In the coming months, in the coming years, because of the deterioration of the, econom of the economy, the opposition could win by a wider margin. My answer was, it could work in normal democracies. But in Venezuela, what they have is a disguise of democracy. They have elections, but no democracy. And in accordance with the history of the old and new communist regimes, when they cannot win elections, they never allow the opposition to win. They eliminate the opposition violently. And look what is happening in Venezuela. They are passing from fraud in the elections to violence against the leaders of the opposition. And we saw two weeks ago, look at the Facebook photographs of Maria Corina Machado. Her nose, her cheeks were broken. In the plenary of the parliament, because she's a member of the opposition. Therefore, what uh, makes me concerned the most is this kind of complacency, of appeasement, of uh, tolerance, of permissiveness regarding these new dictators. Even in my country, President Santos now is, is very, he wants to please the dictatorship in Venezuela, because the dictatorship in Venezuela that promoted, that promoted uh, uh, narco-trafficking in Colombia and, promo and promoted terrorism in Colombia, now has said that they uh, have the keys for FARC to come to terms with, uh, with our administration at the price of, of impunity. And impunity is the source of new violence. Therefore, we can, I, I, I am in disagreement with this attitude in the region regarding the dictatorship of Venezuela. Remember, the region rally on the idea of requesting Peru for Fujimori to step down, and he did. And Peru did call for new election. Why the region do not react against the case of this brutal dictatorship in Venezuela? You, uh, you've been speaking widely on this uh, subject. You raise a number of issues that I would like to follow up on, but you, you speak, you've spoken widely on the subject of your successor's negotiations with the FARC, and you deeply, it's unusual in your country for uh, a president, a former president, to speak out as vigorously as you, uh, as you have. So your contention is that um, it is because of these negotiations that uh, your president has taken a blind eye on abuses in Venezuela, democratic abuses in Venezuela. Oh, this is one of the points, Professor. I was asked in Colombia, while President Bush has said that he has not to say anything regarding President Obama, why you really every day speak against the government of Santos? And my answer was, because President Obama was elected with a platform totally opposed to the President Bush platform, and President Santos was elected under the support of our own platform. For instance, President Santos, a journalist, were the most critical in the region against the regime of Venezuela. And he did the same 
of, of us Minister of Defense during, the, during three out of five years of our administration. He knew by first hand how the dictatorship of Venezuela has hosted, legitimized, and protected Colombian terrorists. And now, after we elected him, he has become the promoter of the dictatorship of Venezuela. He has said that Venezuela, this dictatorship, is the clue for peace. This is one of my main objections. The second one, impunity. The third one, political eligibility. I have been asked what is the alternative. And I have created, Professor, this difference. Here you have a young gentleman. He wore the uniform of the terrorist group. He took guns, but he did not commit another crime. In this case, I accept that the price of peace is to allow him to reinsert without going to jail, is to allow him to be politically eligible. On the other hand, we have someone, member of the same terrorist groups, guilty of car bombs, guilty of child recruitment, of narco trafficking. I accept that the, peace of price, or, or the price of peace be to give, to give him reduced sentence, shorter sentence, but not impunity. And we cannot forget two elements. What is the difference between the car bombs, the kidnappings of Pablo Escobar, the kingpin of the Medellin cartel, and the car bombs and the kidnappings of FARC? What is the reason to accept impunity for FARC, the largest illicit drugs cartel in the world? But look at this. Three weeks ago, during one weekend, FARC killed 11 soldiers. And the government said nothing. And talks did continue in Cuba. And I said to a rally of young people in my country, imagine, just for discussion, that at any time, the United States made a decision to undertake negotiations with Al-Qaeda. Uh, during the talks, Al-Qaeda killed American soldiers. What would be the reaction? Why we Colombians have to accept that while talks are conducted in Cuba, the same group kills our soldiers here in Colombia? And remember this. In some countries in the region, there has been room for negotiations because guerrillas have been insurgents against dictators and without narco-trafficking. In Colombia, Colombia has the largest democracy all over the region. In the last century, we had only four years of democratic interruption. When Marxist-oriented guerrillas show up to my country, we have already surpassed this period of four-year dictatorship. We have had an open democracy in Colombia, pluralistic democracy. I, I, I say that my policy was a democratic security policy because we provided with effective security the more radical members of the opposition at the same level of security with the security we provided to the closer friends of the government. Therefore, Colombia has a respectful democracy. This is one point. These terrorists uh, uh, have attempted against our democracy for 45 years. And at the same time, they are narco traffickers. When you look at the case of El Salvador, 
guerrillas in Salvador were not narco traffickers. And the, the state of El Salvador had room to open democracy. What these people want now is not to open our democracy because our democracy is totally open. What, want, what they want is to have impunity to legalize this, their money and to be appointed to Congress. Colombia has many smaller terrorist groups. These kind of agreements are bad examples for the other groups and will, and will spark expanding violence for everyone in Colombia agrees with peace. During my administration, we advance a lot in peace, but many of, of us in Colombia disagree with impunity. You, um, as we were speaking earlier, you noted the fact that uh, only once in history has a former president run for office again, uh, a different office uh, in Colombia for the, for the Senate. Uh, there's been some discussion that you might do that. Given what you just said, which was a fairly uh, harsh denunciation of what you think is a central policy issue, uh, would that draw you back into uh, electoral politics? Would this issue be enough to cause you to run for office again? Professor, I have survived many attempts against my life. I, am, mm, I have a, a grandchild. I am old. My white hair is not reversible. <laughs> but Garcia Marquez used in, in a beautiful tale, Garcia Marquez wrote, human beings become older in the mirror before than in real life. When I look at me on the mirror, I say, this is not time for me to be in politics. But, but when I turn my face out of the mirror, I say to myself, I still feel with energy. This country has elected me three times for the senator, for, from the, for the Senate, once for governor, many times as city councilor, two times as president. Why? I won't fight until the last day of my life because I believe in these ideas and uh, I consider that it's my duty to participate every day in the democratic debate. Yesterday I was said by some of the Colombian students who are here. They called me with all the prudence and they told me, we need to announce to you that some people are calling a, pro uh, a, a demonstration against you here. And I said, don't worry, don't worry. I participate in demonstrations by myself every day. Being outspoken of my own ideas, let others express their own ideas. I respect them. Three weeks ago, in a small town near Bogota, while I was in a town meeting, there was a demonstration against me, and I invited them, call, come to this microphone. Blame me whatever you want to say. You have the right to, to be elected. You are different than the terrorists who are in Cuba. I respect you, and I respect your disagreements with me. But what I cannot accept is the terrorist that have kidnapped many Colombians, have blasted many car bombs, be granted impunity, and be converted into electable members of our parliament. Discussion every day, Professor. The democratic debate, debate is always welcome, but without guns, without terrorist groups. So just going back to my question, I'm going to take that answer as a solid maybe. <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I also want to follow up on one the point you made about uh, American uh, policy. Uh, uh, what is your view, first of all, on U.S. relations with the region right now? 
uh, how would you rate them? I got a question, uh, and I'm altering the question a little and asking it that way. Uh, and the second point is on this particular issue of Venezuela, what, what, what is your, you obviously have a strong feeling about it. Do you believe the United States should be taking a position on that uh, issue? As many questions, it is very difficult. Just to the point of narco-trafficking, let me add this. In Latin America, we should request not only los, the, the United States to come to help us against narco-trafficking, but all the industrialized countries. Not only the United States is co-responsible, co-responsible, the other industrialized countries are equally co-responsible. Other topics of the bilateral relationships. In the last year, after the failure of the free trade area of the Americas, the United States made a decision for having bilateral trade agreements in the region with Chile, Peru, Colombia, the United States, offer Ecuador the same possibilities and Bolivia. They rejected. The United States had negotiated with Panama, with Central American countries. Of course, many years ago, it uh, uh, did negotiate with Mexico. Free trade agreements have advanced. During the financial crisis of the years 2008 and 2009, the United States accepted to expand the capitalization of the multilateral agencies. It was very important for the region as a whole. But every day, there are new agencies. It is necessary to have a, no, a one-side cooperation. It is necessary to, to, to have a bilateral cooperation uh, multi-state cooperation. For instance, to cooperate with the Central American countries, we should request it not only from the United States, but also from Mexico, from Colombia, from Panama, from Brazil. The case of Venezuela, the effects the consolidation of this violent dictatorship in Venezuela could be helpful for President Santos to reach agreements with the terrorist group FARC. I disagree. It is against the solidarity we owe to the people of Venezuela. Second, in the short term, the Venezuelan policy of buying support through subsidizing oil, possibly Venezuela, even in the middle of these very difficult economic problems, will keep this policy to keep friends, to keep support in the region. Up to, up to when? I don't know. Because the situation in Venezuela is very difficult. Venezuela was a country without indebtedness. Now, roughly speaking, the public debt in Venezuela represents 72 as percentage to the GDP. Third, in my opinion, the consolidation of this new communist brutal dictatorship in Venezuela is destroying the credibility of our multilateral institutions. There is a growing feeling in the region, considering that the organization of American states is ineffectual. It is very important to have multilateral organizations, such as UNASUR. But why UNASUR? expels, suspends Paraguay because Paraguay apply a constitutional clause. I don't say if, it, if it, is, it was good or bad. Moreover, 
President Lugo, su parte de la decisión a favor de la administración. Lo que yo digo es que esta decisión en Paraguay, buena o bad, fue tomada under la Constitución del año 1992. Para esta constitucional decisión, Paraguay fue suspendido. And the same multilateral institutions do not say anything against the fraud, against the, bio, the governmental violence in Venezuela. At the end, through this way, these multilateral institutions will ruin, will devastate their credibility. What should the United States do? I cannot saying nothing to the, I can't say nothing to the United States, to my government, to Colombia. Colombia should not have recognized the election, the outcome of the elections in Venezuela because of the fraud. Is it possible for any country, the United States or Colombia or Brazil, to protest against alone? No, but it is necessary to rally a group of democratic countries to request new elections, fair elections, transparent elections, with enough international vigilance as a guarantee in Venezuela. I, uh, I know we're running out of time. I just I, I want to honor a couple of these questions that I've got several variations of. Um, one is this. What policies can Colombia pursue or is pursuing to help rural citizens economically without permanent damage to the country's rainforests? Uh, I did explain to you one policy that we implemented, the forest guard families. The main element of rainforest destruction in Colombia at this moment is to replace trees for coca production, for we implemented the forest guard families, for them to no longer destroy the jungle and to supervise the recovery of the jungle and to be paid under the monitoring of the United Nations. Colombia, it is very important to be highlighted during the Barco administration, in between 1986 and 1990, Colombia recognized titles to the indigenous communities for 33 million hectares, mainly of rainforest. And they have become in some degree, they have done well at keeping the jungle. However, we need to look for a solution because it is necessary that they keep the jungle, but it is necessary to find ways for us to build infrastructure, to have mining with technology, because if they keep the jungle, but at the same time, they stop the construction of infra infrastructure, they prohibit the advancement or development in my country, at the end, we are going to suffer a damage. It is necessary to find it, some balance. Well, this, is, this seems like the right question to ask as a last question. Uh, a significant problem I find in many South- Excuse countries. me slowly, please. Oh, I, I am all more deaf even in Spanish, <laughs> but it's a great limitation for being a singer, <laughs> but a great quality for being a politician. <laughs> uh, a significant problem I find in many South American countries is the lack of respect that inhabitants have towards the government and authority. How do you think that respect can be instilled in inhabitants again? In other words, how do you re-instill faith in institutions uh, across the region? Of course. And I want to highlight the case of Uruguay, 
Uruguay is having a leftist democratic government, but with all the respect for the institutions. And it has increased the people's respect for the institutional framework of the country. Well, uh, on behalf of all of these uh, folks and uh, the university, we're so pleased that you spent some time with us. Your, uh, your insights are sharp. Your passion is obvious. Uh, your political career apparently not over. But uh, uh, we, we, uh, we're honored to have you here today. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, thank you, Professor. It has been a, a great honor for me. Thank you to all of you.